Welcome to the epic Game of Thrones on steroids. This was originally a fantasy flight game that I took and enhanced, adding over 400 cards to allow for more intrigue, diplomacy, and military uh, campaigns so that you can play one of the noble houses in the uh, Game of Thrones and with the goal of becoming the sitting on the Iron Throne and being uncontested by subduing your foes until they bow their knee to your kingship or uh, enlisting allies that will work with you uh, to keep your uncontested reign on the Iron Throne or controlling more uh, castles and lands so that you're undefeatable. The game can be played with five to seven players and any remaining houses, there's nine houses total, become um, non-player houses that can be actually uh, used by any faction on their turn to create havoc and disrupt. Along with this tutorial, when we play the game, there is the Laws of Westeros rulebook that I've alphabetized all the rules in it so that you can easily access them during the game if a rule question comes up. And in addition, in the back of the book are all the tables that uh, certain actions refer to. Go to a table here or a table there and you roll a 10-sided dice and consult the results on the table uh, to see what happened. In addition to the main rule book that is there for everyone, there are individual house rule books. And in those rule books, they show you the advantages your faction has over the other. Some houses have more intrigue cards and intrigue abilities. Other houses have more military abilities. And so each house has a strength or and perhaps a weakness that you need to exploit and use to your advantage and to uh, get other houses that would ally with you that have an advantage that is maybe your weakness um, so that you can sit on the Iron Throne. The game is played on a large six foot epic board game that is uh, 3D'd with uh, l black lines that indicate the different regions that you can move through. Uh, also, you can notice on the ocean, there's also black lines which are much larger than the land lines, so you can move further on ships. And uh, uh, we'll get into ships later. But uh, you, each house will get their own uh, noble castle and a port that they control to start the game with, and then they have to consolidate their region and get uh, do diplomatic actions to get all the rest of the people in their region to uh, side with them, to gain uh, military strength, to build their troop, uh, their armies, to increase their supply, etc., etc. So, um, you uh, the initial couple turns are used mainly in your own region to consolidate your region. Uh, there's been a civil war that has happened before all this game began so the land is very divided and so you have to reunite uh, your region before you can press forward and start conquering other lands yeah as you can see at the other end of the board there is a, a large uh, board that allows you to keep track of your supply that's the barrels uh, wh what order you are on the track what or what turn order you take uh, any uh, quests that you you might send your children on, uh, extra victory points that you earn uh, through the game, uh, all sorts of things it keeps track of, um, and other players can look at the board and see what 
uh, their enemies are at to help gauge um, their intelligence on how they should approach that enemy. Each player has a, a dice rolling tray and uh, a player station, which we'll get into later and explain in more detail. But I wanted to show you an overview of the map. You'll be marching your armies across these lands, marching your, uh, uh, sailing your ships across the shores um, to accomplish your goals. The first thing that's established is the initial turn order, uh, which is different from the, the actual tracks. Uh, so the number one position is the king. The number two position is the hero with the Valerian sword. The number three position is the master of whispers. The number four position is the master uh, the uh, hand of the king excuse me hand of the king number five position is the uh, master of coin number six position is the master of lore number seventh position is the uh, uh, champion that goes under the the uh, valerian sword hero the number eight position is the master spy which goes under the Master of Whispers. And the ninth position is holding position in court. And so um, these will be randomly uh, drawn through a card draw in the beginning of the game. So um, each position has a certain advantage that I'll try to explain when we get to the individual tracks. has a uh, card like this that's laminated uh, with the turn uh, phase sequence on it so you can always refer to that if you're uh, forgetting what's next or what to do next. Uh, always plan ahead when there's a downtime, other players are doing something. Always be looking at your next turn, your next phase and planning it so that you, that you don't spend a lot of time. Uh, phase one is the card draw. Uh, this is where all players uh, draw whatever cards they're allowed based on their position on the tracks. Uh, you get extra card draws. Also, um, any quests are declared. Usually you send a child out for a quest and they have to go through three uh, obstacles. So it takes three turns to complete a quest. And there's a way to mark that on the board and you assign one of your leaders, preferably a child, to go out on a quest. So uh, this is an overview of what happens uh, when you draw cards. Uh, every house gets at least um, two cards to draw, and you always have to always draw one card from your house deck. Uh, by the way, your house deck has your two other elite, special elite units. So you want to consistently draw from your house deck. The house deck is actually made up of three types of cards that are also um, a little more powerful if you draw from these three decks. But they're diplomacy cards that allow you to do diplomatic actions and have bonuses intrigue cards that allow you to hatch plots or defend yourself against plots, and then um, uh, combat cards that allow you to have strategic combat options that you can use throughout the game. So you're going to always be drawing so many cards. Um, there's no hand limit to the amount of cards you can have, and there's a place on your player board to place all the three decks, the Diplomacy, Intrigue, and um, uh, Military cards face up so you can see them and flip through them easy. The, the key, though, is you don't ever really want to have more than uh, a handful in each deck or, or it'll get too cumbersome and you'll get lost trying to find cards. So um, what I always do is as, as I build my deck, I'm constantly looking through my cards and, and, 
and placing the one I want to use next on top of the card. Um, so every house has their house deck, which has these three in it, but then there's more powerful versions of these three cards from the main deck uh, that you only can draw from if you have a position on the track. So um, this gives you uh, uh, the diplomacy card. Anybody that has this logo can draw from the diplomacy. So anybody that's uh, the king, the hand of the king, uh, master of coins, master of lore, or uh, in the court can draw from this deck. But uh, the king gets to draw three extra cards. So he can draw two cards from his house deck and three cards from a diplomacy deck. Um, the... Uh, uh, Hand of the King can draw two extra cards from the Diplomacy deck, the Master of Coins one extra card, and the Master of Lore and the uh, Holding Court can draw one of their two cards from the uh, deck. Uh, those that are on the uh, the two people, there are three people that are on the uh, track uh, remember, all nine houses go on. So sometimes this, it may be a, a non-player house that op 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 occupies one of these tracks. But whoever is the um, master of whispers gets to draw three extra cards from the intrigue deck. Whoever is the leading spy gets to draw two cards from the intrigue deck. And uh, whoever holds this third position can draw one card from the uh, intrigue deck. So it's really good to get on that track. And then we have the uh, military um, master of swords. And in this case, um, the first five positions can hold um, uh, can draw from this card, but as you can see, um, uh, it's supposed to have a number here, but the, uh, the only person that actually gets to draw extra cards is the uh, person that holds the Valerian Sword token. He gets to uh, draw two cards, and uh, actually this guy gets to draw one card. Uh, those numbers should be on there. Uh, I don't know why they're not. And then all the rest of these guys... Um, can draw from the uh, Warfare deck uh, as one of their uh, two cards, and so one of their house cards in an uh, Infra deck. But more importantly um, are these stars. So um, as you'll see when we get to the orders, the stars, uh, the more star tokens you can use, the better um, the outcome. So uh, there are two star tokens. So this person could use two, two star tokens or four one star tokens, which would give them a, quite a bit of an advantage. And this uh, can use three stars, uh, three star token, two, 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 one, one. Um, so um, it's the higher you are on the Valerian sword track, the more intrigue, I mean, the more warfare you're going to be able, more strategy you're going to be able to pull off, and the more better outcome in battle. Okay, on phase two, you draw event card one. There's three event cards that you draw from. Um, so event card one deals with uh, taxes, collection. I'll show you on this next slide. Uh, you can muster two gold at every port, which isn't a tax, by the way. Um, it's just a collection from revenue. Uh, you can uh, muster your troops. Uh, and that's basically, you look at uh, the inventory card and see how many troops you can muster and where they muster. Uh, you can collect taxes. Um, you can uh, supply refit. And so basically, uh, each player, um, you pair off, players pair off, um, look across the table, and they play uh, one of their cards. 
and uh, this card is drawn for the whole group, so everybody gets this the benefit of event one. And then um, each player can play one card. They can build an item. They can bring in one of their elite troops. Or if, um, for example, if taxes are played, they can't do uh, collect taxes. But they could do a supply refit or muster army if they had a card that allowed them to do that. So you can do several actions. And so one player does their plays their card and resolves the action. Then the other player um, uh, does their action and while the other player is observing, that's way we kind of be a judge for each other. Phase three um, is where event two card is drawn and the following actions can take place. Uh, you can uh, gain influence tokens or gain, gain hero tokens. Uh, there, uh, this logo, by the way, um, whenever you see this logo, you have to advance the wildling track one, the threat increases. And uh, it comes to a point where uh, it has to be dealt with and everybody has to bid, and that's a separate uh, rule set that when we get to that, uh, it, it'll become clear. But influence tokens are purple, and uh, hero tokens, which are the commoners uh, rallying to a person, are brown. Then, then again, everybody pairs off into twos, and any diplomatic actions uh, with minor houses are performed. So you assign a leader and play any diplomatic action cards you have. You also can move one of your armies into a region within your borders. Um, so you can move armies during this turn. It gives you an extra move, basically. Um, so e each person, again, pairs up with the opposite person, and they play whatever card uh, will help them. Uh, you can actually force a smaller house into subjection to bend the knee, um, but on most cases you roll a diplomatic roll. The last thing that can happen only one time during this turn is whoever the, uh, plays a jousting card, and if two players play a jousting card, the player that's higher up on the track gets to go first and they could host a jousting tournament and basically we stop playing the game and everybody assigns a knight to the joust jousting there's always even if they're your sworn enemy you would go to a, a jousting tournament and we basically roll off who wins the first round all the way to the champion and then they're awarded with gold and hero points and, and influence points based on how well you did at the tournament. And several knights have um, tournament abilities. So you want to look through your house cards at your knights to see if they have any ability during a tournament. Now we go to phase four, which is event three. This is where all the nasty backstabbing intrigue takes place. So we have several cards, and you can see the uh, Wildling logo is on uh, several of them. Um, there's a Wildling attacked card, Wildling attack card that's on it um, that uh, means that the Wildlings attack at whatever strength they're at at that moment. Uh, there's also uh, in the expansion, there's uh, the undead, uh, the White Walkers can actually attack, but uh, that's not in the base game. In addition, each player um, has a plot card. Um, another thing of, that can stop the action is an alliance. Uh, there's a card that 
that says uh, alliance or pacts can be made. And that's where we take this card um, on, we have one of every house, and we ask them, you know, can I pass through your land unhindered? Um, can I uh, uh, make a pact with you where we're, neither of us were going to attack each other in, um, this next turn? Um, so you know that, and let's attack a mutual enemy this turn. Um, so uh, the use paper clips and you send it. There's a way to sweeten the pot over. If you see in the right hand corner, you'll see um, two, four, six, and eight, and then a uh, gold influence and supply. You can sweeten the pot with one of those and say, you know, I'll give you two gold or uh, or, or I'll give you four, uh, two gold and two supply. Um, if you go ahead and agree with me on this. And uh, so basically this card is a quick way to to do alliances. You pass them to the the different houses. They say yes or no to the to the idea and then pass them back to you and you know you have at least a pact because um, there's no long-term alliances really with any house um, there's always a way to go around them because uh, you're wanting to rule on the iron throne another thing that can happen um, is a, a maester bid card can show up and what that does is uh, when that card shows up, we put uh, face up all the uh, cards equaling the amount of players. So if there's five players, we put five maester cards face up. And then we start with the first, uh, the king always gets to bid first. And um, there's a number in gold. So he has to start with 12 gold. And then it goes to the next person to his right, and they can either say, I want 13 gold or I'm passing. And you continue around the table until the highest bidder gets the card, and then that bidder can't bid on the remaining cards. Um, the next player uh, in line uh, bids on the card at the, at the starting value, and then uh, it's raised or um, and so the, the one advantage of this is if several people drop out early and get some nice cards, you might be able to pick up a card at cost, which is always nice because uh, you're the, the last player. Um, so uh, you don't you have anybody to outbid you. So when we play a plot card, um, um, in, after the, the main card is drawn, after the event three card is drawn and resolved, what we do is one player plays a plot card. Uh, again, uh, the highest person on the turn order, if there's more than one person trying to play a plot. And then they, uh, with their entry card, they hatch what the plot is. It might try to discredit them. It might try to assassinate them. There's all th kinds of things you can do. You can send them to the wall. You can there. There's there's uh, there's a whole lot of uh, intrigue actions that can be done. And um, a lot of times uh, it'll call for a court. Um, case to be done uh, if they're if they're um, accused of a crime and then all the players there's cards that can assist uh, up the ante of a uh, and you ha all have one in your starter cards you can you can assist the defense or assist the accuser uh, depending upon which where you want to see that leader taken down or saved in the game. And so everybody uh, plays their card, votes their card. You can't, if you don't want to vote at all, you can do that too. And and the, the accusations are higher than the person is accused and tried. Um, there's a chart, I believe, for what happens if they're tried. 
uh, and then uh, if he's innocent, um, it's played. Also, every leader has an intrigue score that he adds to um, his score. So some of the nasty people like uh, Cersei Lannister has a very high intrigue uh, number. So she's really hard to beat. Um, and so if uh, she's accusing Ned Stark, you need a lot of support, ally support, if you're going to uh, be called innocent and not tried. So once you play the plot card, um, it's put uh, on the side of the table. And until all plot cards are used or no one hatches a plot that turn, the cards are not returned to the players. So um, you might go a couple plots and then no one plays plot cards. So everybody gets their plot card back so you can re do do a plot again. Now we come to uh, phase five, which is probably the critical military part of the game. Uh, the next uh, couple uh, phases all deal with actual battles and military objectives. So you have five different orders, and they all do uh, different things. You have a move order, which simply allows you to move your troop uh, in a non-conflict area. So th they're moving into a region that uh, has no other opposing army, or they're moving across the board, or, or they've made an agreement with a, another player to move through their land. Um, and the unstarred token cost you a minus two uh, combat strength. So if they move and they are attacked, uh, they're at a minus two combat strength. Uh, a one star move allows them to move without that uh, negative to the combat strength. And a two star can only be used for uh, units that have more than one movement because you can't um, end up in an enemy territory without battle taking place. But let's say you have a cavalry cal unit and it's uh, got one region that's occupied the enemy and they want to slip through during the night with a two-star unit, you could actually move the, the one and then the second space into an un a contested area um, uh, without incurring a battle. Then there's raid tokens. Raid tokens is you have a unit in a region and you don't actually move the unit, but you uh, he jumps into another region that's occupied and does a raid and then comes back. So he ends up in the same place. So you don't actually move the units. Um, what raids do is they can uh, remove a, a support or consolidate token. Consolidate tokens is where you gather extra um, uh, hero points or um, noble um, influence points. Uh, then A raid with one star can actually remove a, uh, a, po uh, a unit in an opposing area that was going to do a raid. So if they had a raid and you played a one star raid, you could actually stop them. Uh, you can also remove um, the support, consolidate, and the supply token. So if, if they were going to get a supply token in that region um, next turn, um, they would be, uh, that supply would be given to you. So let's say they have a, a one barrel supply on that region, you would 
they would hand you a single barrel uh, from this. Uh, we have an extra barrel supply that you can use for siege and all sorts of other uses. A one barrel supply, by the way, as opposed to a regular supply, uh, allows you to up your uh, units uh, army size uh, for one entire turn. So you can save up some of these barrels and if you need to do uh, up your army, you, you would play, you would use use up the one barrels and you would enlarge your army for that turn to do the attack and then um, next turn you would have to uh, move the army size back down. The final two star raid is um, again you remove a raid support consolidate supply um, the other two raids you actually have to roll on a chart to see if you're successful or not um, but with a two-star raid you always are successful with the raid so you you don't suffer uh, a failed roll you know rolling a bad uh, a one on a, a raid is, is disastrous the next order token is attack tokens. And you, you have a limited supply of all these tokens. And so sometimes you have to use the, because uh, you have so many armies out there, you can have up to six armies um, uh, at any one time, uh, but you only have uh, a few attack tokens. So you might have to use a minus one uh, combat strength attack token in one of your armies, maybe an army that you know is stronger and a minus one isn't going to hurt it. Uh, then there's the regular attack token, and then there's the one star attack token that gives you a plus one to the combat strength, and then a two star at attack token that gives you a plus two to the combat strength. And there's a picture of a unit uh, that is marching. They're 10 millimeter. Support tokens are probably the most critical strategic order that you can give in this game. And the way they work is you have a unit in a region and you play a support token. And when it comes to battle time, they can support one unit, one army in another region. It can be your own army or it can be an allies army. You, you, let's say an allies in a critical battle that that you don't want them to lose. So you could go ahead and use your support to support them. Basically, you can choose uh, one unit to support. Uh, with a one star, they get a plus one, and with a two star, they get a plus two support. Defense tokens normally are um, giving you, uh, basically they're setting up a defense. Um, so if you have to use a negative one, it's, it's considered hasty defense where you really didn't get time to prepare uh, and you're caught on it wears and thus you have a minus one combat strength. But when you have a, um, a regular defense token, uh, you actually get a plus one defense. It should be on here, but it's not. And then a, a one star is a plus two defense and a two star is a plus three defense. So this is incorrect, um, but a one plus, two plus, three plus. Then lastly is the uh, consolidate or influence tokens. And uh, you can get one uh, influence or hero token uh, in that region. Uh, basically what you're doing is uh, your army is not fighting, it's helping a noble uh, build his bridge. Uh, or, or actually that would go either way because the peasants would love you too. So you could get an, uh, either one the noble gives you influence or the the people are happy you help harvest a crop um, this gives you two and this gives you three 
one thing about this game is it's a lengthy game, and so to speed it up, um, the first two turns of new players, they get grace where they can spend a little more time uh, learning how to put out these tokens. But after turn two, we start using a three-minute timer. And if you haven't laid down um, your uh, order tokens face down with the your house seal up uh, by three minutes, then that unit is just basically stuck doing nothing. Now we're at um, phase six of the game, which is the battle round. And then we resolve uh, uh, going, uh, starting with raids, uh, then attacks and support, uh, and finally troop movements. And then the final phase is cons uh, consolidation or picking up influence tokens. Uh, based on the turn order of the Valerian sword. So in this case, the king doesn't get to go first. The, the highest on the Valerian sword gets to go first and on down uh, based on where you are on that. So uh, this is the first person, second person, third person, fourth person, fifth person, sixth person, seventh person. Um, actually, this is rearranged I gotta <laughs> fix that um, so uh, in this we got movement you do movement non-combat movement raids are done and then uh, whether your defense attack or support is all done uh, simultaneously basically um, in other words um, you know this person is defending so they're not going to be moving this person says I'm attacking, they move their unit in, and then we declare who's, who's supporting, uh, if, if they're getting any support. And then finally, any collection of hero points or uh, in influence uh, points uh, from the nobles. And again, uh, this allows you to use stars based on where you are on to simplify things, I have a chart that kind of expels out uh, how a battle is to take place. Um, the defender, uh, you know, what uh, the leader strength is, the combat strength, the, uh, if they have a strategic card that allows them to do something. All this is, is calculated and um, you basically have a, a number that you end up there is a dice roll it's negative two or positive two so uh, you can be off by four if you roll bad and a, your opponent player rolled a plus two and you rolled a minus two you can only be off by four um, so it's kind of the tides of battle um, giving a little uh, a little fudge there but not much so if you have a strong battle plan you usually you'll win so once the battle is finished and you've turned the outcome, there's a post-battle resolution chart, which is on the opposite side of that battle sheet. And uh, basically, uh, on some of the cards, there is a sword icon, which means uh, a unit is removed. Normally, if someone loses, uh, an army loses a battle, they retreat to a safe, so safe region one back. But if there's a sword icon, you actually remove one of the units. But if there's a, uh, a castle icon, you defend against one attack. So depending upon what cards are played, um, both the winner or the loser could lose units uh, in addition to the loser having to retreat. Um, there, uh, some, some cards have a post-resolution outcomes that you, that you have to um, uh, use uh, uh, elite units count as two units if uh, uh, one of them is damaged you actually remove the elite unit and put in a regular unit um, 
or, or, or no, no, excuse me, they have two wounds and they automatically retreat back to their home home castle. And uh, so it walks you through um, uh, how to resolve the battle and then what uh, victory points you get. Uh, so every player gets five victory points for winning the battle. Uh, the loser has to retreat to adjacent land not controlled by an enemy. Um, uh, outnumber units of the loser. If they outnumber units of the loser, they get another. If they're evenly matched, they get a um, hero point. If they're um, smaller, but out strategize, they get a uh, influence and two heroes. Uh, and then additional, um, uh, depending upon how good they do. Uh, so, so if they're uh, fiber, you know, the, the really outnumbered, they really get, I mean, the, the commoners just love the guy, basically. And, and they move up on the Valerian sword track as a result the next time it's bid on. The final resolution, which uh, we just went over, um, uh, there's some cleanup. Uh, uh, there's usually uh, uh, any anything anything on the board needs to be cleaned up. Uh, if there's any uh, non-player um, houses, they go ahead and make their move uh, during this phase. Um, a lot of times, uh, you, a player can control a non-player house, so they can they can disrupt plans by uh, using their armies, which are usually uh, pretty small and uh, uh, most non-player houses tend to be isolationists and stay within their own borders. And there's some rules uh, to take care of that. Here's a review of the post-battle resolution that's on that card. Um, and then the final thing is, of course, you move the turn marker to the next um, position uh, there's 10 game turns uh, that can be played uh, the game can end at 10 game play turns or if all the players uh, can continue to play um, usually you can play two turns per uh, session so um, it would take five sessions to play 10 turns um, uh, often players would rather win the game by having so many, you can win before 10 turns by having so many castles and strongholds and being the king on the throne or, uh, literally by decimating all your enemies, uh, where they all bow their knee to you. There's just several ways to win the game. Real quick over the components. Uh, basically, you get this uh, player sheet that I'm that we've been using for all the uh, phases, with the um, inventory sheet on the other side. You have your house cards, uh, your ten starter cards, your house cards, your ten starter cards, your two starting land cards, your one plot card. Uh, your all your 10 leader cards and then you have a, a tray with all your order tokens and magnetic tray these fit on the board uh, so you can keep track of where you are on the different tracks and where your turn order is this shows you a little how a player station is set up there is a uh, bar here that you can put cards in. Uh, in this example, we have uh, 
Lana Stark uh, actually going on a quest. So we have a quest card that they fulfilled. If they fulfill three quest cards, they get the rare magic heirloom for the family, which gives you a bonus for the rest of the game. Uh, there's a space here for your gold. There's a dice tray. Um, the whatever position you hold on the tracks, you have an icon so the other players can see that. You can store your influence and your hero tokens uh, in, in this tray. So this is your resource tray. This is your dice tray. Um, these, this is an example of two leaders. They're doing the diploma. You've set up for the diplomacy phase. When you actually do the diplomacy phase, you would lay them on the region that they're going to uh, do di a diplomatic action in. They can move to any region within their region, and they can also move uh, unhindered, uh, uncaptured, um, uh, one space uh, outside their region per turn. So sometimes they have to go to the edge, move one space, and then uh, keep moving through the game so you basically lose your leader um, that leader until he resolves his action once he's resolved his diplomatic action though he's returned without uh, having to go back through all those regions uh, here's the place where you put your d different decks uh, you know your uh, intrigue uh, intrigue and diplomacy and military decks Keep your plot card off to the side. Then under the the tray that uh, the drawer that holds everything has also a slit on it, and this is for your armies. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six armies that you can have. Uh, the size of the army depends upon the supply you have, and so um, you assign a leader to each army. And then right here, number 14, you see this card. That's the house leader. Whoever You have to have one person that's leading the house. So remember, you may have a, some positions on the uh, King of Thrones track. Uh, you might be in the small council chamber. You've got to assign a leader for that. So there's great leader resourcing that goes on, and you really need to see what abilities that leader has to where to assign them, whether they're going to be on a diplomatic mission, whether they're going to be uh, usually high intrigue level uh, people are the best people to assign to, uh, to the king's throne track because uh, you're always fighting intrigue at King's Landing. This is a quick uh, show. Um, these are the miniatures that fit in the case. Uh, number two is number two here is th these are the miniatures, and this is the um, uh, C tokens. And so um, the way they work is normally you just move a ship one space on the uh, visible C tracks, but if you want to move beyond the uh, coastal regions, you place a ship on the edge of a coastal region and they're marked along the side of the thing and then you put a number uh, of on that uh, ship and then you begin to um, each turn move uh, that ship one region but it's invisible to the other players. So that ship is so far out to sea that it can't be seen. And you count, you know, let's say it takes four moves to get to where you want to attack. And then you bring that ship out on that new space and um, uh, players can confirm um, that it's been three turns and you've moved the proper amount of distance so that um, you can't cheat that away. Um, with the inventory seat, as you get your land cards, anytime you conquer a land, um, it will have a, a gold collection, a supply, uh, royalty uh, influence, hero influence. If it's a port, um, what kind of uh, 
troops you can muster from uh, your lands. Um, and so um, this is a total of all those cards. And so when it comes to uh, collect taxes, you can just look and say, OK, I'm going to get three taxes uh, total from the few lands I have that it, actually that number should be much higher. Um, uh, but there's four supply tokens I've now got, uh, but I just got a land. So there's five supply and I can move the supply uh, barrel up on the track, which means I can have larger armies. Um, and then uh, I have two ports so uh, I could build uh, instead of mustering troops, I could muster two ships uh, if I had uh, enough mustering points to and supply to fulfill that. So this is how you keep track. Also, there's a space here for uh, if you want to remember who your allies are or who your enemies are, you can circle them or put a paper clip on it uh, that allows you to kind of keep track. There's also some um, banners here. And these banners, uh, basically, if you're king of um, that sits on the Iron Throne, you can put up your banners in your in the throne room uh, to display your house seal. Again, this is a close-up sheet of the uh, inventory sheet that you can use to. Uh, keep track of your allies, your enemies, uh, totals of supply, and uh, how many stars you have on the track uh, and how, how you use them per turn. Uh, how many cards, you can put the number of cards that you can extra draw. Um, so, and each house has one of these. Uh, this was just an example of, uh, I guess this is their starter cards. Uh, I don't think that's on every one, but uh, anyway, that's a quick overview. A uh, real quick uh, on leader cards. Um, basically, um, the value of the leader at the end of the game, um, and you can get two times. Uh, in gold, his ransom. So if if you if you captured Tywin Lannister, um, there would be uh, 32 gold uh, to return him uh, to his house. Uh, that's this number here. Then the next number is the uh, diplomatic level uh, that they have. Uh, when doing diplomacy, the anchor, if there's an anchor, it means that they can captain a ship or a fleet of ships. And so you always need uh, someone with an anchor to lead uh, a ship. So a single ship is usually not good to have. You usually want a couple ships because there's a limited number of people that can pilot ships. Uh, this is their uh, strategic military strength and it adds to the role in battle if the leader is in command of that army in addition to all the cards leader cards that, I mean sometimes you can use more than one military card uh, there's the house seal the name of the player uh, the, the Raven is the intrigue level that they get to um, add uh, to the uh, final 10 sided roll. So, uh, and then there's a personal combat level uh, used when they're doing one on one battles. And then in the text box, there's their special abilities. So um, uh, certain leaders, um, for example, um, a Lannister gains two extra gold at the beginning of every turn. So as long as he's alive, you're getting two extra gold. Uh, 
every turn, even if there's no tax collection or not. In addition, by the way, Lannisters have gold mines where they get gold from that. So they can uh, always pay their debts. So that's pretty much it. Um, uh, a basic uh, review. Um, by the way, you're, if you're a king, you actually slide the leader card down into the throne. There's a slot um, so that, uh, and then you display your banners proudly on these two pillars. And uh, hopefully you can hold that position as king long enough to win the game. Thanks for watching, and I hope uh, to see you at the gaming table.